All right. Marshall, you want to say a couple of words of introduction? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, this has been uh, life changing. Uh, seriously, uh, Frank and I uh, have been advocating for uh, native plantings on Long Island and otherwise uh, in, in our work, uh, and that led us to, uh, to Doug's work. And um, along came um, Nature's Best Hope, uh, released uh, February 10th uh, as a Kindle, so we were re <laughs> eager to read it. And it just, it was um, so, so clear and, and so inspiring. It, it gave uh, us, each of us, and collectively a roadmap whereby we could uh, restore habitat uh, starting in our own yards. It, I mean, in, in a world where the, the environmental threats are so monumental, it, it, it's uh, very empowering to, um, to just start where you live. So um, about 1,500 native plants later on, on like four tenths of an acre, thanks to Frank, um, you know, we just, um, we, we made something that is inspiring every day. Every day I wake up and I, and I fall in love with my plants, which is exactly what Doug said would happen. And I think that's how we uh, really create this spirit of local stewardship that can really um, move mountains if we all move uh, together to re-embrace nature in our, in our own property. So that's what we're here to do today is to talk about the science, but also about healing, healing us and, and nature together. Yeah, and just, and just a, two, a few words from my end, and then we'll get to the, uh, the regularly featured program. Um, we should mention, uh, my name is Frank Piccinini, uh, co-founder of Simple Consulting, also president of Spadefoot Design and Construction, which is our install arm. Uh, we really are trying to uh, take uh, Doug's playbook uh, and, and, and effectuate change here on Long Island. So we really want to restore nature. We want to retain stormwater on site. Um, and we really want to connect the general public uh, to nature. And, and it really can be done in your backyard in small little uh, bits and bites of nature. Um, so, you know, without further ado, nature's best hope. Um, Doug, if you want to take it away and give your presentation, we'd be really grateful. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, before I start, I want to remind everybody, wherever you are in the country, wherever you are in the world, um, what I'm talking about are general patterns, ecological patterns, ecological um, rules really that occur everywhere on the planet. So uh, don't think, well, this is only happening in, in the mid-Atlantic states of the US. Uh, so the examples I use largely are from uh, where I live because that's where I live, but um, they apply pretty much everywhere. All right, with that, uh, be, I'm gonna tell you my idea of what nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to return to what happened last fall. Not this fall, but last fall, we had uh, what we call an oak mast. All of the red oaks got together from Massachusetts all the way down to, to Georgia and uh, actually west to the Mississippi. And they decided to all make their acorns at the same time. That's what a mast is. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those, those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of that acorn. Didn't take long. Uh, and then uh, once it made a little hole, it forced its way through there, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy, and then finally plopped down to the ground. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because it tastes really good. A lot of things want to eat it. So it's got to get to safety, and it does that by wriggling and squirming and goes beneath the soil um, in about 30 seconds, where it stretches in all different directions and forms a chamber and then converts to a pupa in that chamber, and then it stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. Now, a lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. If this is a female, she chews a hole down into the center of the acorn, turns around, lays an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets down there. We might wonder why they spend two years underground before they come out. Well, red oak acorns take 18 months to develop, complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Well, that leaves a hole in the acorn and it's a true vacuum. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. Well, in this case, nature has filled that vacuum with three species of temnothorax ants <laughs> um, that live in the vacated holes made by acorn 
weevils. And when they find a brand new hole, they get very excited because their, their old acorn is probably two years old, it's dilapidated. So what they wanna do is move their colony into that hole. They alert everybody and then work hard carrying the larvae, the eggs, the, the pupae, even the queen into the new acorn. They set up a guard here at the entrance and don't let anybody else in. And this is where they stay for the next two years uh, until this acorn falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, what is your, what is your point? What are you trying to tell us? Uh, I'm trying to tell you that that is just one of literally millions of specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. Uh, this is another one, the relationship between jays and, and uh, oaks. Jays are the primary dispersers of oak acorns. Uh, they can fly up to two miles from the parent tree and then tap that acorn beneath the ground. Uh, and of course, the idea is that they're going to eat it during the wintertime, but they only remember where a quarter of the acorns they put underground are, which means, and they can, they can move uh, about 4,000 acorns per jay per year. So they're planting about 3,000 oak trees every year. Hmm. You're not going to have pileated woodpeckers breeding anywhere near you if you don't have lots of carpenter ants, because that's the only thing they feed their young on. And you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that support them. You're not going to have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have facilia, because that is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. As a matter of fact, out of the 4,000 species of native bees we have, over a third of them are highly specialized, and they can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. For example, where we are, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You're not going to have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. So nature is a series of specialized relationships, but today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, the state of Arizona was planning to mine the Grand Canyon and Teddy heard about that. He went to the canyon stood on the edge, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that uh, it's no longer possible to leave most of the country as it was because we haven't. Only about 5% of the lower 48 states are anything close to its original pristine condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US, which is, that's four and a half times the size of Texas. We've paved it, of course, or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents that many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done all that. Um, well, you know, the, the attitude that uh, our nest, planet Earth, was so big we could foul it forever without any consequences, you know, that has been our culture for centuries. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's one third of our bird population gone. Now the UN is, is warning that we could lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, re, they report this as if it's just another headline. They might as well say we, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline uh, because it's not an option. It is simply not an option to lose that many species. Well, I could go on about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, and that's upon all of our houses, but that's not what this, this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, the great Edward, Edward O. Wilson from Harvard, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in a paper called The Little Things That Run the World. This was the very first issue of conservation biology, 1987. So the 
conservation as a discipline is a very, very young. Well, his message in this paper was, was simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants on the planet. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, that would drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats, which would collapse the food webs that support our animals. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and to a lesser extent, freshwater fish would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth uh, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have would be bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is none of this has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, let me just remind you that humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature. We're not gonna be around unless we have healthy ecosystems producing what we call ecosystem services. Here are just some of the things that plants give us. How about oxygen? Pretty important. Uh, they also clean water. They slow its journey to the, to the sea where we can't really use it because it's too salty. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants, of course, are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, using the carbon to build their own tissues, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground. That's the key right there. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. They also build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, lots of important things. What do, what do uh, animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and of course, many other things. The point is that designing landscapes like this that don't produce any of those ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, we need more ecosystem services than ever. So it is absolutely not an option today. There were visionaries through the ages who recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with the earth that supported us. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent uh, early part of 1900s. He wrote extensively. One of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now there have been some indigenous groups that have been able to do that uh, for, for long periods, but by and large, our, our giant Western extractive capitalistic societies, the, the giant uh, Asian societies, we've been terrible at, at living sustainably with, with earth. So Aldo had a dream that we would actually develop what he called a land ethic. In his dream, uh, we would use the earth. We'd have to farm it and lumber it and graze and, and, and mine and do all the things that we do but we would learn how to do that gently. We would learn how to do it without destroying local ecosystems. And in his famous book, Sand County Almanac, uh, that's what he described as the land ethic. What he did not ever talk about, and I'm not sure why, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and again, I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist together in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of, of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture, uh, that he didn't see it as an option. I'm gonna argue this morning that, that living with nature not only is an option, it's the only viable option that is left to us at this point. In the past, of course, conservationists worked almost exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Now we have to turn that on its head. We have to rebuild natural systems where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Where should we do that? Well, let's return to private land here. Uh, at least in, in the US, most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored private property, if we didn't consider conservation on those private holdings, we would fail because we would not be doing uh, conservation on enough land to make it work. But there are a lot of areas we don't typically think of as possibilities for conservation uh, that we need to start thinking about. And, and here's just a list of, of some of them. Power and pipeline rights of ways, 21 million acres in those types of rights of wills, three, three more million acres in railroad rights of ways, seven, 17 million acres in roadsides, 
um, golf courses, 2 million acres, airports, 3 million. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge places. And we have all the places where we live, uh, our both rural and suburban and, and urban centers, hundreds of millions of acres there. If you just add up these places, that's 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, plus California, plus Texas. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. Now, when I use the term conservation, uh, I'm, I'm really using it incorrectly because I'm not talking about conserving what's there and intact. We've, we've, you know, we've torn apart most of it. So um, we're not talking about conservation. We're talking about restoration. But I'll be challenged on that term too because people say you're never going to put back exactly what, what was there. That's right. I, I never am. But that's not the goal. The goal is to reassemble those specialized interactions that are nature. Uh, they may not be exactly what was at that place uh, 300 years ago, but that doesn't matter. They can still uh, form new ecosystems that will be productive and produce those ecosystem services. But not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the building blocks, the most important species that other species depend on. And one of the first things we have to do is reconstruct a food web. Food web, of course, is, is, um, starts with plants. Plants are gathering energy from the sun and turning it into food. And that food is what allows all the animals on the planet to exist. Uh, well, most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. And that something typically is insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. It turns out caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So imagine what would happen if we built landscapes that didn't have caterpillars in them. Most of the energy would remain locked up in plants and you would have uh, either a very depauperate food web or one that doesn't exist at all. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example uh, because we have a lot of data on, on chickadees. Uh, I've got chickadees at my feeder right now uh, eating seeds and most people think of them as seed eaters but when they're reproducing their babies can't eat seeds. Most bird babies cannot eat seeds. They they have to have insects. So chickadees switch to insects and most of those insects are caterpillars and they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on, on insects and most of those insects again are caterpillars. How do we know that? Well, there's, there's lots of, uh, of lines of data that suggest that, but this is a study that my one of my recent PhD students um, completed. It was a citizen science project where she put out a call this was Ashley Kennedy's work. She put out a call for people, photographers across the country to take pictures of birds while they were bringing food back to the nest. Uh, and she identified what was in the beaks of those birds and reconstructed the nestling diet for 20 of the common bird families in North America. She got thousands of pictures so she could do this. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet for these different bird families. That was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominated the nestling diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we built landscapes without caterpillars. You would lose 16 out of the 20 common bird families. Something special about caterpillars, what is it? Actually, there's several things special about caterpillars. Um, one is that most of them are soft. So imagine that this, this caterpillar here is like a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's undigestible. So birds don't want a lot of it. And it's surrounding a lot of very good food. And because it's soft, the parent bird can, can stuff that caterpillar down the throat of their baby without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a, a parent feed its young, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Um, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to uh, many other insects, particularly beetles that are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Most of a beetle is, is uh, undigestible material uh, and they have a lot of sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. 
and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. They have to get them from plants and they have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure that I, I eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and I eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I, I get all of that stuff because uh, it stimulates my immune system. And I, can, I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. He takes those lutein's and he builds pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids? They're getting them from what they eat, of course, but carotenoid levels are not uh, equal in different bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars, far more carotenoids than any other food source for birds. Uh, followed by orthopteroids, things like uh, grasshoppers and katydids and crickets. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves, not many carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillar that eats the green leaves and that's where the carotenoids are. And finally, here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid content influence how birds forage for food? Well, Ashley did another study with bluebirds where she put GoPro cameras on the roof of bluebird boxes and those cameras took a picture once every second. Uh, the idea was to get a good picture of the bluebird when it flew into the nest carrying a prey item. And a lot of times the birds landed on the roof of the, of the nest box and actually posed. It was, it was very nice. Uh, well, because she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of bluebird boxes and she did it for three years, she, got, she had over a million pictures she had to go through. But out of the million pictures, she got 7,628 that were good enough where she could identify the prey item and create this graph. And it shows very clearly the caterpillars were taken more often than anything else. And they have the highest level of carotenoids followed by those orthopteroids, which have the nest's highest level. And then everybody else is nestled down here. So all this suggests that caterpillars, at least for birds, may not be optional parts of their diet. It's looking like they are essential parts of their diet. So let's just accept that, that caterpillars that uh, birds need caterpillars. The next question would be, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands to make, to, to get uh, one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days, but they're flying all around so nobody's been able to count that. Now, if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you've got to have that many caterpillars in your yard because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we construct landscapes that don't have that many caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And when you have insect declines, it's certainly look like, looking like that's one of the major factors contributing to bird declines. I say that because we took a look at the data that Rosenberg et al. used to, to uh, come up with the conclusion that we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided those birds into species that for which insects were essential and species that did not depend on insects. These would be the finches, the doves, and a few other groups that can rear their young on seeds. They actually gained uh, some numbers during that 50 years, but the species that depended on insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, uh, but it certainly is suggestive that there is a relationship between declining insects and declining birds. So we don't have time to wonder whether or not cause and effect is, is real here. Let's just say, Birds require caterpillars, and I'm using birds as an example because many things require caterpillars and other insects. So we need to start to landscape uh, in a way that creates the food that runs these food webs. A new goal for landscaping. In the past, we've, we've created landscapes that had no insects because we thought that was, that was the way to go. 
we're going to change that that mindset and we're going to we're going to add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make them that seems easy enough but there is a catch and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars so we have to be very selective we have to pick the ones that do uh, support caterpillars why is that uh, that's because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. And the monarch butterfly is a perfect example. If you want monarchs breeding in your yard, uh, you can't give them crepe myrtles or boxwood or, or hostas or burning bush or calorie pear or any of the other things we put in our landscapes and expect to have monarchs. They can't eat any of that stuff. You need milkweeds or you're not going to have monarchs. And that is the case for most of the insects that are eating plants. We call them host plant specialists. Why are they host plant specialists? Well, plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those leaves. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those leaves. They're simply too, too, too toxic, too, too, too unpalatable. And if you don't believe me, next year when the green leaves come out, walk outside, grab a leaf and eat it and see if you like it. You will understand why most of the insects cannot eat most of those plants. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage protects itself with a unique combination of, of chemical defenses. Insects cannot adapt. Any one insect cannot adapt to all of those combinations. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are very similar in how they defend themselves. And they build adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. They create enzymes that can store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. Uh, behavioral adaptations, life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of, of evolutionary history with each plant lineage for these adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reconstruct viable food webs in places where we've deconstructed them, we've got to choose the plants that support those food webs. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well this works, starting with uh, our own house here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in this window right now. Uh, we live on 10 acres of a farm that was, was broken up. Um, it was an old, old farm had been in, in production since the late 1600s, so about 300 years. Soil was totally exhausted. The last thing they did before they broke up the farm was to mow it for hay. But uh, by this time, the land was thoroughly invaded with, with Asian ornamentals, things like Oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and multiflora rose and on and on. So when they mowed for hay, they were really mowing the, the rootstocks of Asian plants and calling it hay. Well, of course, when we started to build the house, the mowing stopped, and this is what came back, um, all of those invasives from those giant rootstocks. So we had 10 acres that looked like Sleeping Beauty's castle. Now, that's my wife, Cindy. She's getting ready to get rid of all this stuff. If you have a serious invasive problem and you, you think it's just hopeless, it's not. It's not. You know, if Cindy can clear 10 acres, um, you, you can too. Uh, it's, you know, it's not labor free, that's for sure. Uh, and she had the advantage of enjoying doing it. But now I helped a little bit, but not all that much because I was busy putting plants back. And I chose plants um, selfishly. I wanted to I wanted to plant plants that I hoped would attract species of caterpillars that I wanted to take pictures of. My little my little hobby. So I started with a Canadian outlet. I wanted to attract this interesting caterpillar and its adult that looks like a leaf. But in order to do that, I had to put meadow rue back into our land because that is the only plant that they will eat. Um, well, we didn't have any meadow rue. There's no meadow rue anywhere around us because the entire area had been had mowed to death or uh, agricultured to death for hundreds of years. So I got some meadow rue seed from someplace else, planted them, they grew very nicely. Uh, but this is an experiment. I didn't know uh, how long it would take the Canadian outlet to find the meadow rue or if they ever would. So I didn't go out and, and check it. Uh, in the beginning, maybe after a month and a half, I did walk by and I noticed, whoa, um, they were almost defoliated. The Canadian Alice had not only found them, but they found them in spades and 
it was a real success. So uh, now we have a healthy population of metaru and Canadian alets, which means we've added two species to our property that, that had been removed uh, a long time ago. Here's another uh, success story. This is the goldenrod stowaway. It's a misnomer, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. Now I knew where some Biden's was. Uh, it was uh, in a power line cut about 14 miles away. Went and got some seeds, planted them. They grew very nicely. It took about a year for the moth to find the plant, but it did. And now we have a good population of both of those. So there we go. We've added four species to the, to the property. I wanted Hackberry Emperor because it's a butterfly that should be on our property. But as the name suggests, it is a specialist on Hackberry. And we didn't have any hackberries, so I planted it. Another plant that was here in the old days, but long gone. Uh, this, it took the, the hackberry emperor three, four years to, to find our hackberry, but um, now they're here uh, in numbers. I looked at one of my hackberry branches in June, and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on one single branch. Another big success. So we've added six species. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own and along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod. Where I live, there are 110 species of caterpillars that eat goldenrod. Like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcedura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct Sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now here's one that hasn't come yet, the goldenrod flower moth. Uh, that's what the adult looks like. That's what the caterpillars look like. I don't know why it hasn't found us uh, yet, but um, this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Um, and it's fun. Every year I go out and I, I, I check for uh, the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm gonna find it and that will be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper for the same reason. Uh, it's a very powerful plant that supports lots of sphinx moths. Things like uh, the beautiful Pandora sphinx and it's equally beautiful adult. The lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx and many other creatures. I wanted the zebra swallowtail because I think it's our prettiest swallowtail. But this was pushing it. We are at the northern limit of uh, zebra swallowtails and the pawpaws they depend on. They are pawpaw specialists. We planted pawpaws, but the nearest population I knew about is 26 miles south of us. And I just didn't know if they'd be able to make it up here. Well, it took them nine years, but they finally did come. And now we have a population of both of those. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx and lots of pawpaws. Planted uh, elm to get the double tooth prominent. It's a specialist on elm. I just think it's a very cool looking caterpillar. So we planted American elm that worked really well. I wanted the evening primrose moth again because it's beautiful, I have a beauty like anybody else. So we planted evening primrose and they spend the day nestled into the flowers. It's very cute. Uh, and we planted lots of oaks. Now, those are just examples of what we've added to our, our property, but I wanna focus on oaks for a while because they're such an important plant. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Um, some of you have probably seen it. People argue about whether it is 400 years old or 500 years old. It is enormous. Uh, but a lot of people think you need enormous oaks before they can start contributing to your property. That is not true. I've he heard people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, unless you die before next year, you can enjoy it. And I, I'll tell you that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks from acorns or two foot bare root whips. Uh, and right away, they started to attract the insects that uh, require oaks, things like the solitary oak leaf miner, the juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the orange-headed epicalema, red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks we put in our yard and they come right away. This is a pin, uh, baby pin oak that's just popped up above the leaves and here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating those leaves. You do not have to wait hundreds of years before your oaks start to contribute life to your property. This is a picture of our house from the same perspective that I took the, the original one, uh, just to show you, we put plants back. Yes, we have some lawn, but we put a lot of plants back. Not all of them, we're still adding plants, but right away I noticed that moth species started to come to our house. Remember, every moth species is a, a 
type of bird food. So I made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth I could find at our house. And I started four years ago, I'm still working on it, but I'm up to 1,024 species of moths that have joined us in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Now we live on 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area of Pennsylvania, we're supporting 40% 40, 40 of all the moss species in Pennsylvania. And because that's so much bird food, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 38% of all the terrestrial bird species that breed in, in Pennsylvania. This works. Saw this headline, what, two weeks ago, the World Wildlife Fund says that two thirds of the wildlife have vanished from Earth since 1970. All I can say is not at our house. As a matter of fact, I, I will wager with confidence that we have more than increased biodiversity at our house by uh, two thirds, simply by putting the plants back. And I, and I mention this because um, I wanna give you, give you some hope. This is reversible. If we simply take care of the land that we are on, we can recreate the life that used to be here. But I know what you're thinking. You don't own 10 acres and it's only gonna work on a big parcel of land. Can it work in suburbia as well? That's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. I was there just before the virus broke out, literally just before like two days. Um, but they live in a typical suburban neighborhood. They have 0.6 acres, so about 18 times less land than, than we have. And they're surrounded by neighbors that have big lawns and the typical suburban thing. Uh, the big invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle, it's everywhere. So the first thing the church did was get rid of that, put in a bunch of native plants and also a water feature they called a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their, their yard. They're up to 149 species, 35 warbler species. Just as a comparison, you know, we've got, we've got uh, 10 acres and we've only recorded eight species at our house. So it works on smaller pieces of property. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in, in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, she's got one tenth acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And, and she is not connected to any type of preserved habitat at all. She's a little teeny island right next to one of the runways of O'Hare Airport, right next to Kennedy Expressway. Um, but she got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, another water feature. And then she started to count her birds. She's up to 116 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock right there. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house in Chicago. But what about city centers? You know, 82% of us uh, live in, in North America anyway, live in cities. Well, that's uh, another good question. Way back in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed, but that reminds me, we have a terrible marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed anymore. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. I was staring at Monarch's Delight in 2014. The first thing I saw were two species of, of uh, leafcutter bee. This is a megachylid leafcutter bee. I know it's leafcutter bee because it carries its pollen on its tummy, not on its legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves. Leaves um, like uh, the ones that redbud produce, those are great for leafcutter bees because they snip out the edges of those leaves, roll them up and stuff the, the little roll with pollen and that's where they lay their egg and, and uh, their, their larvae develop. They, they take that whole roll and stick it in a crack or a crevice. Well, there was a redbud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. So the leafcutter bees had everything they needed and they were there. And because there was a red bud there, there was early season uh, forage for bumblebees. There were also bumblebees there. Remember early in the season, queen bumblebees, that's the only thing that's there. They don't have any workers yet. The queen has to do all the work. So she needs very efficient sources of pollen and nectar uh, and the red bud supplies it. Then I saw a monarch, actually I saw two monarchs foraging on the monarch's delight. Now this was 2014, 2013 was the low point in the monarch population. Only 3.6% of our monarchs remained. I had gone all of, of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. And this was June. It was early in the season. 
it is unusual for monarchs to get this far north uh, that early in the season. And here I was seeing two of them, so I was very encouraged. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight. They also had another species of milkweed that was in bloom. So they had uh, nectar and they also had the host plant that their larvae require. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan, middle of New York City. High Line is a converted, uh, um, it was an elevated railroad that was abandoned, but uh, somebody went up and noticed there were a lot of native plants growing up there all by themselves. So they actually sunk a lot of money into it and renovated it, made it a tourist destination. And there's, there's the nature right there, a little strip of planting, um, 30 feet above the taxis and everything else, you know, very busy place. And now it's such a popular place, literally millions of people go there. But so do the monarchs and the megachylid bees. Somebody's just finished a bee survey of the highland, they're up to 30 species. There's lots of things using the life on the high line. Now this is Rick Dark. Uh, he and I co-authored a book, The Living Landscape, back in 2014. He always wanted me to go to the high line and see the beautiful plants. Well, I like beautiful plants, but I really like the things that use those plants and I'm not much of a city boy. So um, finally, I, I dragged my feet, but finally he, he got me there. Uh, and that's what I saw that day. Uh, I, was, I was amazed. I was totally wrong that things would not be able to find the plants on the high line. So it convinced me that if thoughtful native plantings can bring back life to the middle of Manhattan, um, we can do this anywhere. And all of the plants on the high line are not native. So, you know, this was a, an example of compromise. This is going to work, but there's four things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way. And the first one is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn. We have 40 million acres of lawn in this country. Uh, because it's a status symbol. It's a status symbol of good citizenship, of, of wealth, um, of, of following the, the culture. But it's 40 million acres of dead space, and uh, that's the size of New England that is, is taken out of ecosystem production. So we can't afford that. I'm suggesting we cut that area in half by planting um, half the area we have in lawn. The other half, you know, the area that stays in lawn will be manicured. We're still going to be good citizens. We're not going to be thrown out of our, our neighborhoods. But if we replant half the area in lawn, that gives us 20 million acres to work with in terms of, of conservation. And if we do it at home, we can create a new national park uh, that we can call Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. If we do this, if we bring life back to our living spaces, uh, it gives us the opportunity of, of developing for the first time or, or reestablishing a personal relationship with the natural world. And we can do it at our own time, our own pace, very important. All you have to do is, is walk outside. Um, you can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, millions of people. So, you know, you're dealing with a little bit of nature and a whole lot of people. It's also free, there's no admission fee. And uh, it doesn't matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike, um, it's never closed no travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. That's how you're going to develop that, that personal relationship, which, which that's what's going to help you to care about the things that, that we depend on so that you will be a good steward of them. This is especially important for our kids. Richard Lou says our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So what do we do? We, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus, uh, with a teacher and they, they drive for an hour and go to a natural area, walk around for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything and then they get back on the bus and they go home. Uh, and that's their experience with the natural world. I'm sure that's better than nothing. But what it's really an experience with is 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not, not to touch anything. If they have something natural at home, they can simply walk outside and discover it on their own. No parental supervision, let them do it on their own and then it will mean something to them. They might even learn how to hunt lizards. And I'm learning this from my own granddaughter. This is Zoe who lives in Hawaii. And her patch of nature is not big, about 10 by 10 feet of, of lawn with a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. And Zoe has uh, invented this game of sneaking up on the anole lizards. This is how you 
This is how you do it. You hunt lizards by getting on the ground and disguising yourself with leaves and sticks so they don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly. No smiling. This is very serious stuff. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But then you, you, you catch the anole, you put it in an aquarium, and you've got that personal relationship with nature. I don't think Zoe's going to be doing this the rest of her life, but I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of your li her life. If you want to do more than hunt lizards, uh, get this book by Nancy Stranisti, Nature Play at Home, gives you lots of great examples of how to expose your kids and yourself to the wonders that can be part of nature. All right, so we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put back in uh, what used to be lawn? Well, part of them, some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. One of the most important things we've discovered in my lab in recent years is that all of our native plants are not equal in what they contribute to local food webs. As a matter of fact, there's a few doing most of the work and the rest are just coasting. About 5% of our native plants are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food. That means about 85% of our native plants and eh, not doing all that much. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. But the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our landscapes? Or benign plants or even worse, those, those invasive ornamentals that we, we love so much, our calorie pear and our burning bush and our barberry and all that stuff that's wreaking havoc. It's biological pollution in our natural areas. I get an email once or twice a year from somebody saying, don't I know that, that uh, ginkgo biloba, ginkgos from, from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. And that makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Remember, this is not our, this is not our metric anymore. We can argue about whether uh, you know, something was here 7 million years ago is, is uh, native or not. But um, the real question is, are they productive? I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon seven million years ago, they produced zero species of caterpillars. So if you want to support food webs, wherever you are, ginkgo is not going to do it for you. What's going to do it? Well, in 84% of the counties of, of North America, and I'd love to get the same data from Europe because I bet it's the same over there. Oaks, most, most productive genus that we have, 557 species of caterpillars, which is 557 species of bird food produced uh, in just in the mid-Atlantic states and over 900 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to this in productivity. Here's the power of keystone oaks in, in my yard. Remember, I've recorded uh, 1,024 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, so this is just moss. Uh, out of that 1,024, 900 of them have known host plants. So 124 of them, we don't know what they, what they eat. Out of the 900 that we do know what they eat, 265 species use oaks. And we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property, only one of which is the genus Quercus. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. Yet they support almost 30% of our moss species diversity and are the backbone of the, the uh, bird food, uh, of the bird food webs. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of our landscapes. That's what keystone plants are doing. How do you find out what, what keystone plants are? Well, in North America, you can go to the Native Plant Finder uh, on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most productive plants, both woody plants and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. Now notice that I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native maples. That's because you can easily go to the, to the nursery and say, I wanna buy a cherry. They'll sell you a cherry from Asia. I wanna buy a willow. They'll sell you the weeping willow from, from uh, the, uh, the uh, what? <laughs> Where's Iraq? The Middle East over there. Native maples, I'll tell you a Japanese maple. So um, specify that even though these are native genera, you want the native species of those genera. Because if you get the non-native members of those, those genera, uh, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We did that experiment. Uh, 
These are the top producing herbaceous plants in most of the counties of, of North America. Goldenrod's very high, native asters very high, native sunflower is very high. They're also the top three genera supporting our specialist native bees in many places. With those three, three genera alone, you can typically have over 40 species of, of native bees in your yard that you wouldn't have if you didn't have those, those genera. So we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in those keystone plants, attract lots of insects, lots of moths to our, our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light. That, of course, is not the goal, uh, but a lot of research, particularly from Europe, is telling us that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. We still, after 100 years of wondering why insects are attracted to lights, we still don't know, but they are. And they can die in a number of different ways. The moths will fly around and around and around and die of exhaustion. They collide with the light and, and get killed. They get incinerated. They die of dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. A lot of nocturnal insects are blinded by lights. Who knew? Uh, and it, it messes up their daily activities of trying to find a mate and reproduce. Uh, so to me, this is actually really good news. This is, if this is a major cause of insect declines, it's good news because it's so easily reversed. All we have to do is turn our lights out. I know what you're going to say. I can't turn my lights out because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man comes. And the first thing you're going to notice is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take out the white light particularly the mercury vapor lamp, they're the worst, and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects than our white wavelengths. And yellow LED lights are the least attractive. If we were to switch out our night lights with yellow LED lights, we would save billions of insects almost instantly. Uh, and we'd save a lot of energy at the same time. Seems like a no brainer to me. Fourth thing we need to do is create landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the plant itself. The caterpillar eats the leaf, spins a cocoon and hangs from the branches, then it emerges as an adult and does it all over again. I wish they all did that, but they don't. Most, 94%, 480 species drop from the tree and wiggle their way underground where they form a pupa underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And the problem of course, is that we don't have any leaf litter under our trees. We don't tolerate it and we mow and compact our soil to the point where it's too hard for the caterpillar to get under underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. The adult moths come in, fly, lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, they drop down and die. The next generation is smaller and the next generation of that is probably gone. I am convinced this is another major cause of insect declines simply by the way we landscape. And the cement landscape in cities is even, even less a viable option. I'm not trying to discourage trees in, in cities. Uh, I am trying to discourage the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. That's just, that's just laziness. And it risks, it risks our watersheds as well. This is what most people do. They put in a tree in a big, big yard. Now, nobody has studied uh, how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but I guarantee they survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree than a layered landscape. Maybe you can have a dogwood over here. It's a native azalea, ferns and ground cover. The caterpillar drops down, can easily get below ground or spin a cocoon in the leaf litter. It's a safe site. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. Uh, create beautiful beds around your trees. So the caterpillar drops down and again, a safe site. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put, put beds around your trees and that's of course area that's not in lawn anymore. This is where you can use your, your native ground covers like wild ginger or, or native pachysandra or foam flower or may apple, um, lots and lots of options, all safe sites. Another PhD student, Desiree Narango, did work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And uh, one of the conclusions of her work is that there is compromise, room for compromise in our plant choices. She compared how well chickadee populations could be sustained in landscapes dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by our typical introduced um, Asian ornamentals. And the first thing she found is that when we're looking at landscapes dominated by ornamentals, the Asian ornamentals, um, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, there's 75% less chickadee food there. 
they were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now their nest box is up in each one of these landscapes, uh, but the chickadees would come, they'd look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and uh, maturation was delayed by 1.5 days. You might say, well, those aren't huge differences. But if you put all them together in a population growth model, this is what you get. As a function of the percentage of non-native uh, woody plant biomass in your, your landscape from nothing to 100% non-native plants. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the, the uh, population must make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at, at that rate, then your population is not growing, but it's not shrinking either. It's a sustainable population. If you reproduce more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you have fewer babies than adults that are dying, you have a shrinking population, an unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap, around 30% um, non-native woody plant biomass. So as soon as you exceed 30% um, biomass in your yard, you're down here in the unsustainable part of the relationship. We've measured how many, uh, what the percentage of non-native plants are, woody plants are in um, the, the neighborhoods near me. I'm talking about Southeast Pennsylvania, Northeast Maryland and Delaware, 82% non-native plants. So way down here in the unsustainable part. And that's pretty typical. But this is what I'm excited about. Two, two things. This is the first time this has been measured for any, any bird anywhere. So anybody who's doubting that your plant choice actually impacts other creatures, this is a good place to, to uh, convince yourself that, that uh, it does. But this is the area of compromise I'm talking about. You can have your ginkgo. You can have your, your uh, crepe myrtle. You can have your boxwood. You can't have any invasive ornamentals. No bread for pears. No, no, no uh, barberry or burning bush. No privet. Because they don't stay there. They become biological pollution. But um, you know our hostas are beautiful accent plants. Uh, as long as it doesn't exceed 30% of the woody plant biomass. Um, and you can, you can have those plants without destroying bird populations. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. Of course they can. Here's, this is a, a formal garden in North Carolina that is transforming itself from uh, all non-native to no, all native. These are, these are Joe Pies here. Notice I did not say Joe Pie weed. They are not weeds. And their goal is to replace everything with, with native plants. Uh, Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay to do that because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden in a typical suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it. Look at all the plants you have there. If everybody did this, we would be servicing our pollinators uh, far better than we are right now. You know, I, uh, people say, well, we need pollinators for agriculture. And um, that, is, that is at least partially true, but that's not why we need pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Again, if we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Not just near agriculture. We need them everywhere where we want plants, which is everywhere. So putting them in our suburban yards, in our urban yards, is essential. This is a design by, by Drew Latham. Uh, it's a much bigger planning, but look, it's, it's, it's got formality to it. Nobody's going to object to that. Imagine the amount of life that is here compared to the amount of life that is here. Zero versus a lot. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and there's more and more programs popping up to do just that. Minnesota has a cost sharing program to encourage homeowners to uh, replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie planning. It's a very popular program. Uh, farther, parts of Florida that have burrowing owls that are paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in their front yards. This is the way the, the uh, Endangered Species Act should have been written. The burrowing owl is a listed species, um, but you get paid if you take care of it. You know, if everybody got paid who took care of, of uh, endangered species, everybody would want one. I mean, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have a problem instead of being punished. That's the way the Endangered Species Act should be rewritten. 
Missouri uh, at least had, and I know Fayetteville, Arkansas still does have a bounty on cattle repairs. Um, so not only are not planning on them anymore, but if you if you uh, document that you've taken out a cattle repair, they give you a free tree replacement. San Antonio, uh, a public utility uh, in San Antonio is giving people $100 coupons to replace uh, water hungry plants in, in uh, their yards with water efficient native plants. And then we have all of the cost sharing programs or the, the um, rebate programs where uh, in the far west, particularly California, people are paid up to $2 per square foot for getting rid of their, their thirsty lawns. We've made three missteps in the early years of conservation, at least in my opinion. And the first one is that we, we have assumed that nature is important, but not essential. And you know that's a critical mistake because whenever resources are in short supply, which is always, that means nature loses. If it's not essential, you know, okay. It doesn't mean we don't like it, we do like it. I was in, in uh, the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. There was a wall sized poster that said, we're gonna save wildlife for future generations. And I hear that from the top conservation biologists. Uh, and I under understand we want future generations to understand what, what wildlife is all about. But to me, that suggests nature's, um, it's there for entertainment. It's much more than that. We need to save wildlife so that we have future generations. It's a more urgent message. Number two, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now, I alluded to this earlier, but if we restrict our conservation efforts just to the relatively untouched areas of the planet, um, we're condemning them to failure because those areas are not large enough to sustain the life that we need them to sustain. David Quammen has a, uh, an excellent analogy between Persian rug, a Persian rug and functional ecosystems. This is a, a, a functional Persian rug. This is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet earth that have no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our, our infrastructure, our roadsides. So what we have to do is put the plants back into all those places where we've removed them. Not just to create biological carters so the plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we play. In other words, we're gonna start to live. We're gonna share our spaces with nature and glue our rug back together again. Our third misstep was to, to leave earth stewardship to, to just a few specialists, a few ecologists, few conservation biologists. We did not see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. I don't know how we got there because every person on the planet in, depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth once said that the Western settler minds, he was a Cherokee elder, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You know, you're not born with these, these mindsets, you're taught them. We're good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching, uh, you know, conveying to our culture that everyone has an obligation to take care of the earth, everyone. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. So many of us feel absolutely powerless now. The problems on the planet are, are enormous and you feel like one person can't make a difference. But plant that oak tree, plant a black cherry. You, you, know, you can see life come to these things. You can, you can, if you shrink your lawn, get rid of your invasive species, put in your, your pollinator garden, um, you will see that it makes an enormous difference and you're just one person, you did it. You become an important cog in the, the wheel of, of uh, conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problem. Just worry about your piece of the earth. If you own property, that's obvious, that's your responsibility. And again, if everybody took care of their, their own property uh, in the Eastern US, we'd be 85% done. If you don't own property, you can volunteer and help somebody who does or help a land conservancy or a, a park or preserve. They all need volunteer labor because they're underfunded and, and uh, they don't have enough personnel. So as property owners or volunteers, 
Each one of us has the power and certainly the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Wow, I, I think I speak for the group. Um, what an incredible presentation and, and what an inspiration. Um, you know, your books, your presentation, all of your work. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge the, the crowd here. We, we specifically kept it very intimate. Um, there's a lot of government officials on, county, state, Department of State. There's also a, um, I, I'll, I'll shout out to Fran Twilliger, who is uh, one of Simple's clients, a real estate developer, who is really looking to do right by the environment in their work. I was hoping, um, and we can go to the, the crowd questions, but I'd love for you, Doug, um, to, to address two separate questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, for, for the government officials in the room, um, and, and certainly not any of these, you know, we, we have governments on Long Island still handing out Calgary pears as part of the, the planted tree program. So, um, you know, th this is Long Island, but we're, we're slowly chipping away at it. But what can you say to the government officials here? What can they do? How can they help? How can they encourage people to knit together this Persian rug? Um, and, and similarly, as a separate question, you know, what can the real estate developers do to really address uh, nature here and bring nature home? as you so eloquently put it. Um, you know, that of course is the question I've been wrangling with for the last 15 years. How do I convince people that what we're doing isn't working? Uh, I'm getting a lot of help by these major headlines that we're seeing. You know, when the insect apocalypse headline hit the, hit the New York Times, I didn't think anybody would care, but I, I was wrong. I got instant emails from all over the country saying, well, is this, oh, this is terrible. What can we do? What can we do? Then, you know, loss of 3 billion birds. People like birds. So what it does is reinforce what I've been saying for, for you know, more than a decade with real numbers to say, this is a serious issue. So right away, we've got more public support than we had just a few years ago from these major headlines. Uh, I guess, you know, to convince government, uh, government officials, we have to convince them that their, their constituents care about this. Hmm. I mean, you know, when for elected officials, they'll do whatever they're going to get, <laughs> it takes to get reelected. And if they think that this is what people want, uh, there can be a, uh, an economic argument made for it. Uh, you know, mowing roadsides for no reason, and it's been demonstrated, it really is for, for no reason. None of this oh, animals are gonna jump out. That's been proven not, not to, to be the case. That costs a lot of money. You know, we, we, can, we can do better. Uh, so it's, it's education. It's why I write, write the books to try to uh, get, get the word out. I do see the, change, the culture changing over the last 10 years. Uh, and it's actually changing faster than I thought it would. Um, the native plant sales are going through the roof pretty much everywhere. So, but you know, they, to encourage people by, by, uh, or to encourage the planting of, of calorie pear, I mean, that's, that's simply ignorance. I mean, it's <laughs> almost everybody knows that this, that's like spreading smallpox spores on your property. I mean, we just don't do that. Um, so I don't know, we have to, you know, look, look what we're doing right here. This is, this is very positive because, uh, you know, even five years ago, we wouldn't have been having this this meeting. So it's it's going to happen. Um, I have a question uh, before we uh, have everyone else hop in. Just to, first of all, behind me wasn't uh, this was all inspired. All these native plants were inspired by uh, the professor and, and his book. Uh, but my my question is really one of the moment. Uh, we have several uh, bills being. Uh, crafted uh, in Congress right now around a civilian conservation corps. Um, people are um, flocking to the fact that we need to uh, uh, heal our habitats. Um, what would you recommend uh, to, to Washington? How much uh, would this local, how could this local stewardship be rolled into a, uh, a federal program around uh, conservation? <laughs> I guess I would look to what FDR did. I mean, there are still uh, those conservation programs that they had back in the 30s. They're still out there. We can we can visit them all the time. They last forever. Everybody's out of work. I mean, gee, it's a it's a no brainer. You you put it together in in a way that is going to it's going to increase. I guess the central message is 
we depend on these ecosystems and we need more ecosystem services. If we insist on growing our population forever, which of course is not gonna work, we need to grow the resources too, not decrease them. Right now, every human being we add to the planet decreases the, the resources we have because we've got this humans are here and nature someplace else attitude. Mm -hmm. There is no someplace else. So if we're gonna have more humans, we gotta have nature and humans together. It's not optional. That's the message we have to get across to Congress. This is not optional. How are we gonna put it back? That's a great way, uh, CCC. Well, it, it really starts at home. Um, and given the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic, not having to move and repairing our communities would not be a bad use of resources. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, a lot of people have talked about how valuable it's been to be able to, to even just walk around their yard um, without a mask on and, and, and not be fearful. Uh, it's restorative. I didn't talk at all about all the medical benefits associated with, with even 15 minutes in nature, but uh, it's amazing research. Lower your blood pressure, um, decrease your, your uh, stress hormone, your cortisol. Those are valuable things um, that contribute to curing cancer, doing all kinds of incredible things. So mm. there's, there's value in it at every level. Mm. I think uh, beauty is a tough argument to beat. I think you really need to. But move it doesn't have parts. to be either or. Right. It can be both. It can be right. look at your yard. It can be both. Um, well, I, I could go on all day, of course, but uh, uh, let's get to some of the questions that we have in the uh, in the queue here. Uh, Dorian Dale asked about Phragmites. It's been here forever. At what point uh, does something stop being uh, uh, non-native? Okay, excellent question. Um, particularly in Long Island, Phragmites has been here about 400 years. So you might say, well, that's plenty of time now it's a native. Well, it, it is a native when it acts like a native. So how do we know what Phragmites native potential is? We go to where it's native in Europe and we measure what it's doing over there. It supports 175 species of insects in Europe. After 400 years of being here, it supports five. Has it reached its native potential? Not even close. And in the meantime, it forms these dense monocultures that exclude much more productive plants. So uh, when, when can we declare it a native? When it acts like one. And you'll be talking about tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Meantime, we got to remove it. And, uh, <laughs> and we yeah. can. I believe we yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I, I wanted to ask a question from my own professional work. Um, it, it's really tough to plant in a typical suburban um, you know, setting. Uh, just finding species that work, upland plants that flower that, you know, don't get so huge that, you know, people are getting excited by local codes. What's your stance on near natives, things that are local to the region and might support, um, might support some pollinators? I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Or, or are you more um, and near native, do you mean cultivars of native species? Is that what you're talking no, about? No, like like something like an echinacea, like a purple cone right, flower, right, not yeah. native to Long Island per se, but native yeah. to the region. Yeah. Um, okay, it's a good question. Uh, and, and I don't want to discourage purists who say it's got to be from your neighborhood. That's fine if you want to do that. I, I am not that pure. Um, because the things that use plants have much bigger distributions. It's, it's typically the, the provenance restrictions of the plant that restricts it. So for example, if, if I have a caterpillar that eats American beech, American beech goes from the panhandle of Florida all the way up into Canada and, and you know, all the way to, out to the Mississippi. I could take a leaf from any one of those beaches anywhere and give it to the caterpillar and it would be fine for it. So that's a very broad food web there. But if I took a, a uh, if I took a Florida genotype beech and planted it in my yard, it would die the first winter because it doesn't have the, the genetic makeup to handle the, the cold, even though it's the same species. So, so matching echinacea is not killed up here because you get a lot of cold, you know, where's that from, Tennessee or, you know, I think that's where it's from. Um, but the, the uh, particularly the generalist pollinators uh, can use it just fine. And we also are finding that as, as plants move around, and they always have moved around. Remember, the glaciers pushed things all the way back to the, to the Gulf Coast. And then as they receded, the plants moved back up. So, um, so the plants and the things that use those plants are, are used to, to moving over um, not enormous time scales. Uh, so, so many of the things that, that eat echinacea are moving with it. 
I had echinacea in, in our old house and there's a, a specialist um, stratiomyid fly. I don't even know what it does on it, but uh, it was there, followed it there. The, the spice bush swallow or the um, pipe vine swallowtail. You know, pipe vine and the swallowtail are, are features of the Appalachian mountains. Well, we have moved pipe vine ornamentally all the way to the Atlantic Ocean and this, this swallowtail followed it. So we've accelerated moves that might have happened on their own, but this is, it's still a specialized relationship that's intact. So I'm a little looser on that, that uh, those restrictions. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I too am looser. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, what one, I have to acknowledge Karen Bloomer in the room. Um, she's uh, with the Open Space Council. Uh, an incredible, uh, incredible advocate for the environment has been doing this for years and years. Um, so, so kudos to Karen. Um, she and I have had passionate discussions about um, a self-heal approach, meaning basically just uh, weeding out invasives and seeing what the seed bank contains and, and letting it restore um, versus what I view to be more of a rest restoration ecology. Sometimes I feel as if you have to jumpstart ecological succession given the, the difficulty in dealing with uh, invasive plants. So I, I wonder if you could touch on that um, mm -hmm. discussion. I think it's a very interesting one. Yeah, you know, a lot of it has to do with your budget and, and your patience, but addition by subtraction is, is a viable approach. You simply take out what you don't want and keep taking it out. And most of the time that'll be those uh, invasives that keep coming in. Uh, and local plants will reestablish themselves. The blue jays will fly in and plant your oak trees and your beaches. And um, I've seen a lot of that happen at, at our house. Uh, and it happens faster than, than you might think. Um, but you know, uh, you know better than anybody, clients want instant gratification. <laughs> you know? And they also don't wanna have to do the work. In right. that case, they're gonna hire you to do it. And their addition by subtraction is probably not gonna work, so. Uh, but once you get hooked, it, there's there's nothing like it. I, I I was I didn't know that English ivy was invasive <laughs> when I started. You might have thought it would have picked that one up. Uh, well. <laughs> but I became an assassin. I, I, we we go out like ninja like around the town and we we kill the English ivy. It's a well, lot good of fun. for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, it's a very intimate audience. Um, I'm comfortable um, as long as people respect, you know, the time slots. If you want to raise your hand and speak directly to Doug, I mean, what an what an opportunity. Friend, anybody wants to hop in? Oh, uh, here's a, a question from uh, Sally Kellogg. Hello, Sally. It says, could oak wilt impact the types of oak trees that support these robust species populations? Absolutely. Not just oak wilt, but oak leaf scorch. <laughs> Um, heaven forbid that sudden oak death sort syndrome comes, but these these diseases uh, can be devastating. We've got oak leaf scorch on my property. Um, fortunately, it looks like that one uh, is not deadly enough. I mean, it, there there's resistance showing up already. So there are some of my trees that don't have it at all. That hits the red oak group. So right away, that favors the white oak group. If you go a little farther west than oak, oak um, wilt, is hitting the white oak group and that favors the red oak group. But uh, the, you know, the attitude, which I wanna, I wanna fight against is, oh, oaks are gonna get sick, so we won't plant them. We need to plant, and that goes for ashes too. Yeah, the chances that the ash, the emerald ash borer is gonna clobber it are very high, but we're looking for that one or 2% of the genotypes that are out there that have some resistance because that will be the future of, of ash trees. The, the disease resistant ones in our, for oak, different, different uh, diseases, we've got to discover them, not say we're gonna just kiss off oaks. That's not, that's just not an option. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a tree dies, it dies, plant another one, keep planting them till you find one that lives, but. <laughs> we're having that very experience right now with um, uh, the um, uh, American chestnut. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right? Of course, with the chestnut, you know, once it, they started getting sick, the logger said they're all going to die, and they took every last one of them. Oh my goodness! And, and mm. that, that that eliminated. It could have been a half a percent. Who knows? But there mm. was some resistance out there, and it was all logged. I, I hey, Dan, Robin Sylvester here from. Oh, go ahead, James. Sorry, uh, uh, Professor Tom, You mentioned a few examples of government, you know, partnering with local environmentalists. 
you know, incentivizing, like you mentioned, Minnesota. Can you cite just a few more of those examples? Uh, and, and is there any discussions that you're aware of, say, on the federal level? No, I don't know anything on the federal level. Um, the, you know, there was a, a National Invasive Species Council that I was a member of years ago. Uh, I think it's been dissolved. Um, but even then, it was it was all voluntary. So we'd make recommendations, but you didn't have to follow them. Um, it's tough working with the feds because they want to make every single group happy. So uh, the people that, that populated the Invasive Species Council were all the people that wanted to make sure there were no regulations put on invasive species. Uh, and, so, and we've had some little bit invasive species uh, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I keep learning about these things. Uh, I just learned about the uh, the the um, Bradford Pear Bounty in, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the uh, San Antonio uh, utility that's encouraging. I'm sure there's a lot more out there, but I pretty much gave you the examples that I know of. So, <laughs> point right. is, it can be done. That's you know, we could we could change the entire nation overnight if we change the tax structure of what we do with our, our yard. If you were taxed on the square footage of lawn uh, and got a tax benefit by, by uh, you know, productive plantings. How would we do that? I'm not sure. And it wouldn't have to be much, but they have done it in other countries like Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. uh, you, get a, you get a tax break if you put natives back because uh, the ecotourism business is the number one business in the country. And they had logged so much outside the parks that it was it was clobbering it. So. Uh, and in, well, it's been about 15 years now since they did, well, maybe only 10 years, but they've increased forest cover by 10% in that country simply by changing the tax structure. Oh. They you mentioned the, it, the, the tourism. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. You mentioned that, that they're using prairie grasses in Minnesota. Prairie, you, prairie plants, so not just grasses, yeah. Prairie plants. Are you aware of, so, uh, are there are some other examples that you've come across that might be germane to Long Island? Yeah. Um, no, I don't know <laughs> of other examples. Um, but if I find out, I'll, I'll let Marshall know. <laughs> he can pass them on. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Robin had a Dr. question. Patrick, thank you, Marshall. Thank you so much. And thank you to you and Frank and Simple for putting together this uh, fantastic presentation. I, Doug, I've seen you speak before. I could listen to you over and over again. I could read your book over and over again. Thank you. Um, Marshall introduced me to it several months ago and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've put together, um, even in my own yard, uh, at the encouragement of Frank, I have converted a, a section of my yard. And uh, the experience was amazing. The results were exactly as you predicted. My disbelieving husband now sits in my front yard and watches the bees that <laughs> swarm to these. Excellent. Maybe it's a, a dozen or so plants that are out there. Um, as an organization, we have taken your um, your philosophy as um, to heart, and we've introduced what we call the Bay Friendly Yards program, where we encourage people to convert not their whole yard. You know, we understand that can be overwhelming for people, but just even a section of the yard. And I I love your description of the, it's like um, the the quilt the um, the puzzle pieces coming together. I think that's a really important um, part of your presentation that every little piece counts and every little piece comes together to create a bigger, a bigger ecosystem. Are you doing any sort of um, program that we could team up on? We do say the Great South Bay does Bay Friendly Yard certification. So if people use stormwater management, native plantings and eco-friendly maintenance techniques, they can get their yard certified and, and put one of these beautiful signs I have one actually right here behind me. Put one of these uh, beautiful signs in their yards. Um, well, we do. We have, um, you know, I had this idea of homegrown national park, and and uh, people have said you we want to join homegrown national park. So somebody's actually uh, rebuilt my website. It's called homegrownnationalpark.com, and she's got this interactive map where you can actually join. You know, if you if you. Uh, give us a few statistics and we can see how the, the country becomes populated that way. It's kind of a fun, fun tool. Um, but you know, the, the main thing I've done is, is we do the research that supports the things I say so that we can say them as opposed to going out and actually 
doing the really important stuff of making people do it. I, I haven't been too active. There's only 24 hours in the day. So um, <laughs> yeah, if anybody wants to hop on and help with the research, we certainly need help in that regard. But uh, mm -hmm. otherwise it's what, you know, it's what, what you guys are doing, what, what Marshall and Frank and, and that's where it's, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road and that's where it's, it's making a difference. Absolutely. Marshall, I have a question. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Okay. Go, go ahead, Karen. Cool. <laughs> um, so, and Dorian probably knows this, but we're in the process of um, rethinking our rating sheet for open space purchases at Suffolk County. So, um, I'm the chair of Suffolk County's um, Legislature's Environment Committee, mm -hmm. and while we have uh, dwindling funds, we do still purchase land, and. Um, there are factions within the legislature and across the county who want more points to go to properties that um, abut and are contiguous to other pieces of land that we've purchased. Um, and I understand the habitat formation and the contiguous, the importance of contiguous properties. But I have tried to argue. Um, it's equally important to find pieces, albeit they may be smaller, where there are no other pieces of open space. And so um, it's a discussion we're having now. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, the idea of that, again, I too, you know, really found valuable that um, Persian rug analogy. Um, we need to have uh, land we're protecting everywhere and, and backyards. Uh, I have to transform my own, but um, don't forget I'm, your front I'm now yard. inspired. <laughs> you know, What's they, that? You, don't forget your front yard. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Of course, my front. Um, well, my front yard would be perfect too. You, you'll scandalize <laughs> the neighbors at first. I say, um, the way I would think of it would be, uh, what's your what's your strategy? What's your desired outcome? What species are you looking to protect in that given area? And that will help to guide you uh, as to uh, what. To, uh, you know, plots you, you you choose to preserve. Um, yeah, to, to add to that, what, having these these uh, scattered plots, even if they're not connected, is very valuable for migratory species. It's extremely valuable for migratory birds because they they you know they'll fly 300 miles in a night and then they come down where they are. And I can say, well, the, the nearest rest stop is still 50 miles away. Um, <laughs> Right. So that's the value of that. And, and that, you know, goes for migrating monarch butterflies and a lot of other things migrate too that we don't think about. So you can use that as an argument. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's important that, um, you know, they get, they get, they get points, even though they might not be connecting to a, a larger parcel. It's, mm -hmm. they're, it's valuable everywhere. And it's, mm -hmm. this is difficult. We're trying to reclaim land as well. Mm. It's so important what, this whole, I think the whole purpose of this, we've done our reclaim our water, Dorian has been mm -hmm. very instrumental in that. But I think there's so much land we could reclaim, we could, um, you know, turn it back into something that is really valuable. And, and you've shown here um, a pathway. Uh, so even you know, your, your, your water analogy is a good one to use because you need good um, watershed management everywhere, not just in parks, not just bigger parks. Everywhere has to manage its water properly. Uh, so that's another good argument to expanding beyond, beyond the edges of parks. Uh, I just wanted to, to hop in just real quick. Um, it's, acquisition is important, um, but in, in the face of um, you know, COVID-19 related budget shortfalls, um, we should also keep in mind some of the land that we are already own and, and making those more effective in supporting local e ecosystems. So behind me is a recent project I'm very proud to have been a part of. Um, we turned a local sump in, you know, wrong county, it's in Nassau County, but we turned a sump um, into a bird sanctuary by planting over 70 native trees, um, a, a lot, you know, chestnuts, um, a lot of eco, uh, eco wow. plants, yeah. And, and we removed um, an, a vast field of mugwort, which is so we turned what was effectively a derelict lot into a thriving ecosystem. So it's a model so, template. No, I appreciate that, and I need and I need your help um, and and Dorian's as well support because I met with the Audubon Society a month or two ago, and we discussed. I'm working on legislation 
to transform our highway, you know, Suffolk County Highway Department to be thinking about not uh, mowing, um, you know, in very large swaths, um, we could get away with not mowing and then planting, um, you know, partnering with others to plant things that would help pollinators. And so this is something Suffolk County is working on. We're not, we, I, we don't have it finalized yet, but um, we're definitely thinking about it. Um, I, it's just amazing to me, those numbers um, that you show, showed on the slide really early on um, that included the sides of railroads and under utility lines. And although we'd love to see every utility line on Long Island be a recreational trail right next to that could be pollinator gardens Absolutely. the whole way of course. And, and, yeah. and that would be so important and um, you know I, I'm just I'm, I'm really inspired by everything Good. today thank you Good. Well, Good. Frank literally sprayed on a wildflower field they live they have a technology to spray it right onto the dirt yeah, it's called yeah. hydro hydro seeding um, hydro carrot. seeding and that's, excellent and that's, um, so behind me, you see the, the trees and behind that is, um, you know, it might be a little bit hard to see, but um, there's a big dirt field. And what we're going to be doing in the spring is spraying on um, native grass and flower seeds that some a lot of butterflies delight as uh, Doug uh, calls it. So, you know, it's going to be um, it's going to be incredible. And we're and we, yeah. we're going to look to copy and paste across Long Island. We'd love yeah. to help the Hun county. So someone someone suggested that. And, and I, I'm assuming they're wrong since you're encouraging this, but someone suggested that along the highways wasn't good because of loss. Um, <laughs> you, well, you know, that, that actually comes from my own research. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so um, explain. Well, you know, there are, you don't want to create an right? ecological trap that's going to, where the, the cars just mow down all the, all the bees and things that come in. Um, what I'm calling for is more research about how to do it properly. One thing right. we found is that that um, um, barriers, what are they called? Um, yeah, guardrails? Or? Yeah, guardrails. They actually discourage the bees would hit that and turn around and go back. So we could have art artificial barriers or maybe have offsets. We don't, the, the places we were looking at had habitat right up to the road. Maybe if it's back. Right. Um, some nobody's done that because I'm that's a lot of valuable land um, and people in the Midwest say you know we're talking about about roads where there's a car once every hour you know as opposed we did it in areas where there's high high you know flow through right. traffic well uh, Suffolk County obviously sure know, sure I think of the I think of the one um, county road I've got which is Nichols Road and it's a high travel traverse yeah. road I mean yeah. we have many 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 miles of of roadways some are more used yeah. than others but but i i don't think um i mean i imagine that the the um it can be managed and the, and i don't think anyone we, would be proposing here that it would come to the edge we would right. need that because the don't big have thing we nice discovered is that shoulders. medians people always want to do medians because mm -hmm. it's a lot of habitat but the bees have to cross the road to get to the median right so the, the carnage when there's median plantings was much higher. And okay. that's disappointing, but I don't know. I don't see any way around that. Right. Marshall, well, that's good to know. Yes. I have to, I have to talk to you, Marshall. I have to actually give another webinar now. Well, I, I'm hardly surprised. <laughs> that's the beginning of a, <laughs> uh, of a continuing conversation here. Uh, the uh, video from this uh, with some uh, slight edits in the beginning will be available uh, for the general okay, public great, soon. And, great. And, and thank you again for being such an inspiration and uh, we, we will look here to continue to uh, practice. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you everybody for thank you. participating. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Boone.